Hi, this is Larry Rosenstock with the Apollo 13 crew here. Uh, the, Berk the Cal Berkeley and High Tech High Graduate Schools of Education jointly creating this MOOC. We're really pleased that people around the world are with us and from around the United States. We're going to try to avoid um, United States specific language so that we don't lose our foreign uh, participants uh, to the best that we can. Uh, so we're going to introduce the panels tonight. Again, my name is Larry Rosenstock. I am one of the founders of High Tech High, the CEO of High Tech High, and also the dean of our Graduate School of Education. And so I'm going to identify in, in order uh, the people who should say something about themselves a little bit. Okay, Alec uh, Resnick, would you please go first? Sure. Uh, my name is Alec Resnick. I'm the, the director of a science education nonprofit in Massachusetts called Sprout. That, um, that next year is starting up a, a high school in Somerville um, focused on computation and modeling and representation called the Somerville STEAM Academy. Very good. And what kind of students have attend Sprouts right now? Can you just tell us a little bit about that? Sure, sure. So for the past four years or so, we've been designing and running programs that are meant to bring science into an everyday context in one form or another. So whether it's designing and building your own wind turbine or writing computer programs that play board games. It's a pretty eclectic mix. And in general, the students that we've been working with have been driven partially by our business model, where basically a quarter of the programs we run work with um, wealthy schools that cross-subsidize the other three quarters, um, which are typically um, schools from around Boston, Cambridge, and Somerville that largely don't, don't pay for the programs that we run. Um, over the past four years or so, we've gone from working with schools all around Massachusetts to increasingly focusing just on Somerville students, which are a heavy mix of Portuguese, Hispanic, Latino um, populations, which is not necessarily the, the only populations we've worked with in the past. Very good. Okay, thank you. And Max Green, a student at High Tech High, would you please introduce yourself and say something about uh, how you got here and a bit about it? Sure. So my name is Max Green. I'm a junior at High Tech High in Point Loma. Um, I was invited to this MOOC by Larry, my advisor, and I'm very grateful for that. And I'm excited to talk about um, diversity in schools, especially since it's an issue that affects me. Okay, great. Thanks, Max. And now uh, we have uh, um, Anthony Conright. I'm, I'm, and the way I see the screen, you're in this order, by the way, everybody. <laughs> Anthony. Yeah, you, uh, my you name's were, Anthony. You were, you, were, you were here when we started. And now you're a teacher here. What do you think? Um, Tell us about yourself. Well, now that my uh, students are now seniors, I, I think I'm getting old. But uh, my name is uh, Anthony Conright. I, I teach sixth grade humanities. I graduated from uh, the original High Tech High in 2003. And uh, right after graduation, I started working in the after school program at High Tech Middle. And uh, became an academic coach and worked with students with uh, special needs and uh, was given advice that uh, I should be a teacher and uh, I took it and I've been here ever since. <laughs> and we're really thrilled that you are. And Melissa Agadello, would you please introduce yourself? Sure, my name is Melissa Agadello. I currently serve as um, Dean of Students at High Tech High Media Arts. I am, um, much to my shock and amazement, in my 19th year working in public education. I started out as a Teach for America teacher in 95, and have been through all kinds of iterations of working in all kinds of public schools. So, happy to be at High Tech High for the last six years. Great, thank you. And Veronica Alvarez? Hi, I'm Veronica Alvarez. Um, I am the Director of Operations, and I've been at High Tech High for six years as well. And uh, one of my responsibilities is working um, on admissions, and so I think that's mostly what I'm going to be um, talking about today. Okay, and Patrick, you get to say hi too, please. Hi. Uh, <laughs> the, man, uh, the man behind the curtain, yeah? Yeah. The, the <laughs> Larry, Larry, you're the giant green head, and I'll be yeah, yeah. a little old man. <laughs> um, yeah, so hi everybody, welcome to week three of the, uh, the new school creation MOOC. It's been a wild ride, and I can't wait for, for, the, for the next couple weeks to see right. how it's going to go. Okay, so I'm going to spend some time on some questions of my own before we jump into the questions that have been uh, sent to us from others. Um, you know, we, uh, for those of you who, who are from other countries, there were two uh, very significant court cases in the United States, one in the 1890s, which was Plessy v. Ferguson, in which the Supreme Court said that... Um, 
that the races uh, uh, should have separate but equal schools. And in 1954, there was a case called Brown versus Board of Education in which the Supreme Court said that, uh, quote, um, uh, uh, separate schools are inherently unequal. Um, even though the Supreme Court said that, we pretty much still are living in a plessy world except that they're unequal, but they are separate for the most part in the United States. Um, um, since, uh, Veronica, since you are the person who has learned a lot about um, uh, admissions and a zip code based lottery that attempts to be non meritocratic, can you spend a little time in telling us how that works to assure, to the best of our ability, diversity? Sure. Um, to the best of my knowledge, High Tech High has created this amazing um, lottery system where uh, we use U.S. Census data to um, select our students and to basically ensure that our uh, lottery results, the student population that we um, have at our schools mirrors the community that is um, surrounding the schools, the San Diego community. So um, again, the way we do that is the U.S. Census every few years um, tabulates the number of school-aged children in um, various communities, and we use that data to um, we use the percentages to select the same percentages from the zip codes around our schools, and it is pretty amazing. Um, we a lot of people worked hard to create an algorithm that's pretty complicated, but it actually works. And so our student population is very diverse, and um, it looks very similar to the population of the community in which our schools are located. And what about the information that we don't have intentionally on the in the application process? Can you say what we intentionally don't have? People are always shocked at how simple our application process is. So uh, people often ask me where the essays are, or if there's an interview component necessary, um, or if it's necessary to disclose that their child has an IEP or receives any form of special education. And those are actually things that are not factors in admission. Um, we, it's basically purely random based on where you live. Um, so it's not based on how much you want to attend the school, how your test scores, how well you write. Um, how often you call, it's not based <laughs> on any of those things. Um, so it's really great, it gives students who, um, no matter where they come from, they all pretty much have an equal shot at attending the school. Okay, Anthony, uh, way back in the day that this school didn't even exist, you're somehow, someone in your family applied for you in the lottery and you got in. What well, do you, is there anything you could share with us about how did that happen, and what did that mean to you? Well, um, I was at a predominantly uh, African-American school in southeast San Diego, and uh, there were riots and lots of fighting, lots of uh, gang activity, lots of uh, drugs in the area, and my, my best friend, uh, my best friend's mother decided uh, that uh, we should leave that school and try out this new school that was uh, being developed, and um, and that's kind of how we found out. And uh, the application process, I think, was a little different back then. But uh, we uh, just we went in and applied and saw the school, and I received the letter. Great. Okay. And before I go to Melissa, and I want her to think for a second about how admissions does and doesn't work in at uh, Media Arts High where she is. Alec, what are you thinking about doing for the admissions process uh, when you open uh, your new school? Do you know how it's going to be run? Yeah, yeah, we do. So um, the two biggest parts are, one is we'll be operating this year-round enrollment outreach process where a lot of things about the school that we're starting are very different from people's traditional expectations of school. And so we can't really walk into the average Somerville family's living room and talk about a computational project-based curriculum and have that mean anything, uh, language barriers aside. And so um, this year-round enrollment outreach process is a mix of like in and after school programs and a free summer camp will be running to give people a taste of what that experience is actually like. And then basically we have nine months in which the onus is on us to generate basically a sufficiently broad and diverse distribution of interested families to achieve the following um, setup where half the students will have been labeled by the district as quote-unquote struggling in one way or another 
uh, which for the district means they're in the bottom half of their MCAS, the state standardized test scores, and or their uh, attendance rate. And then the remaining half will be drawn from a basically a weighted lottery that's been weighted to match the socioeconomic and demographic profile of Somerville High School, which um, is actually very different from Somerville at large. Uh, so Somerville at large is pretty rapidly gentrifying three quarters students and young professionals, but because when families can afford to, they leave Somerville for better surrounding districts. By the time you're looking at the high school population, something like three quarters of the students are on free or reduced lunch, meaning they're below 180% of the poverty line. And so um, one of the bigger concerns that people had initially was that in starting a new school, we'd be quote unquote creaming the best students and things like that. And more to address kind of our desire not to start an apartheid school than to address that, but it had the secondary benefit of also addressing those concerns. We've right. um, set up this lottery system around it. Thank, oh, that's great. Okay, thank you. Would, uh, Melissa, would you uh, respond about, you know, just uh, let me say one thing before you do, just to give you just a moment there. You know, the purpose of this, of this course overall for it, of new school creation is to help people who are thinking about creating a new school or recreating an existing school, which I will add is more difficult, as difficult as it might be to start a new school, to help them develop a narrative of their school for prospective parents, students, uh, funders, or authorizers, um, or faculty. And somebody a couple of weeks ago on the MOOC uh, sent in a really great question. I think it was Katarina, if I'm not mistaken, from the Netherlands, which was, is the narrative, is the, the more elegant narrative, the, the more aspirational narrative, the same narrative that you write to your authorizer? And at the time, I would still say the same answer. I said, no. As a matter of fact, I mean, they have to be consistent, of course, uh, in, on some level. But your authorizer is more, that's more of a compliance uh, type of writing where they need to see elements in order to check boxes so that you can get licensed to operate. It shouldn't conflict with the elegance of your aspirational narrative, uh, but the purpose of, of the purpose of this course is to help us all um, try to be better than we are and to develop um, as, uh, as I said, you know, aspirational narratives. Um, Melissa, would you like to address, you know, the experience, that, uh, you know, uh, so far prior to High Tech High or at High Tech High? Sure. Um, you know, I think what's interesting is that it, when we talk about the beauty of the way High Tech High gets our students, um, sometimes I always want to, I, I want to make sure that we point out that when the rubber meets the road, this this empowering um, and and uh, microcosm of society that we create within high tech high also comes with all of the same lumps that sort of come with a regular society right like we have students at a wide variety of ability levels from a wide variety of ethnic and racial backgrounds and much like society and you never know who you're gonna get so to speak with any with any um, situation our schools are built much the same way now what I have to say is like definitely thinking to having work in traditional public schools that are heavily tracked having everyone within the same classroom creates um, unique challenges and unique opportunities that for me I never saw existing within regular public schools where my more core classes, the regular level classes, looked very differently than my AP classes did. Um, so I think um, it's an interesting uh, study in looking at each microcosm within each class at High Tech High because the gifts that the diversity brings also brings its own unique set of challenges. Yeah. Okay, and, and you know, uh, you said, you just mentioned the thing about so the lumps of, of regular society. Anthony, do you remember, for some reason, of the many mistakes that we made in High Tech High, of course, there's no innovation without error, as it's often been said. Uh, Anthony, we, f because of the, the way we had you all, we decided to randomly break you up into a blue team and a yellow team, mm -hmm. right, which we did randomly. Do you remember how many students thought that the blue team were the smart kids and the yellow team weren't? You, I mean, like, so. Yeah, that, that's a, it, I think that's kind of a, one of those partially just kind of, you know, insecurities that a, a person would have. You see a certain group of people uh, going in one direction, you go, oh, well, all these kids that really like, they, they like computers, and they happen to be on the blue team, so they must be smarter. I think it kind of actually gets back to what Melissa just said about how there are smaller microcosms based on um, 
the way society works. When I look at San Diego, I, I see a you know it's a the black population kind of is is in one you know little in one area, and so it's just when you put all of that in um, in a school setting, I think you you do end up with sort of misconceptions or assumptions about which kids are going to be smarter or which kids are going to uh, get along a little better in a in a new environment. And yeah, we, yeah, I, was gonna say, I was going to say that I think that brings up a a, a point though um, that I don't know if we've mentioned um, in the school talk or on the website for the MOOC before, but students don't have a choice as to what class that they're in mm -hmm. at our school. That's like a really big key defining thing is that's so different than my high school experience where I had like the seven periods a day and I had to sign up and there was kind of a lottery system in that because you didn't know which classes were going to fill up too early and <laughs> that kind of thing but at our school the kids are in equity based uh, environments so that they're all getting equal access to the same amount of resources at least that's the idea but to do that they can't really have a choice about where they're going which we call a cohort model. Melissa, could you take a stab at describing how the cohort model works in terms of honors, non-honors, and things like that? Yeah. Uh, I, well, I mean, the easiest and the shortest answer is there are no honors and non-honors in most classes. Um, within each cohort, there's uh, about 50 kids, and within that cohort, um, students are of all different varying ability levels. Um, within any one classroom, it, therefore with a full inclusion model, are students of um, perhaps very low reading levels all the way up to students that are reading already university level books. At the junior and senior level, they could choose to take an honors option, but that does not remove them from the regular classroom environment where they're still working within cohorts and within groupings that um, that are meant to be representational of everything that we know about how the world works. So um, what we do therefore is challenge our students to not only think about their curriculum and their projects, but also to think about how you work within um, groupings that that, re that pose the same sort of challenges we all as adults know exist. You know, I, I can think of many professional situations where um, I, I kind of wondered whether or not we were all going to equally pull our weight, right? I mean, I, I think th the cohort model puts students into a real world um, scenario where they are learning to, to interact with others of varying perspectives, varying backgrounds, and varying abilities. So this gives rise to this question about can you have choice and diversity? Mm -hmm. I'm often, you know, a lot of people who visit us say, well, but there is a self-selection bias for who applies. Anybody want to talk about that self-selection bias that, that, in the group? Um, I will. If Oh, okay, Veronica, thank you. Um. Well, I for, failed to mention earlier that part of my job and what I consider a huge part of my job and a, and a very enjoyable part of my job as well is to um, do outreach and educate. I see it as like parent educator role. So um, I basically make connections with community members, uh, community-based organizations, other schools, and uh, in communities that are underserved educationally or that are low income or that are geographically far away from our schools and um, or not in the directly surrounding area. And I go and talk to parents and students about High Tech High and actually just about school choice in general. A lot of um, families that we are looking to include in our community don't know about educational options and so that's a huge part of uh, what I do for High Tech High is just outreaching to students who would not um, ordinarily choose a charter school or who would not even know that they have uh, many other options outside of their neighborhood school. And we, the other thing that we've done um, in the early going was we had students from, I don't know if you did this, Anthony, we had students from our schools go out to the neighborhood schools that they came from to show uh, kids back there, the work that they were doing. Did you ever do that, Anthony, at all? Do you remember? No, that? they would have run me out of there so fast. <laughs> <laughs> it may not have been safe for me yeah. to go to conference and tell kids to come to high tech high. 
All right. Okay. So okay. So then, Max, I have a question for you, which I always love asking any student here. Mm -hmm. When you are with cousins or friends from other places who don't know anything about High Tech High, and they ask you, "What is that place like, and how is it different from other schools?" What do you usually say? Um, I usually, you know, describe High Tech High as a project-based learning school. I guess that's what it is at its core. And then I have to explain about how, I guess, you know, what you said, we have a, a cohort model for education, so we don't have AP classes, and there's not so much emphasis on, I guess, tracking and, and uh, test scores. And, you know, a, a lot of times the people who I describe High Tech High to are, you know, a bit confused about especially, you know, how well High Tech High prepares students for college and how much work we do. But I think ultimately people are left with, like, you know, a good impression of, of High Tech High. Okay. Very good. Thank you. I would also add that a lot of people come misunderstand what we mean about personalization. Mm -hmm. We do try to personalize here, and they think personalization means, like, everyone gets their own locker with their number on it. <laughs> And what we mean is, you know, from within and your own voice and your own choice. I just want to of make course. that clarification. So I want to move on to the questions that have now been, because uh, we're almost halfway through, the questions that have that have come to us. And I and I thank everybody out there who has taken the trouble to send questions to us. Uh, two of you um, have asked questions that we that are going to be more appropriate uh, in a subsequent meeting when we're talking about. Hiring staff, okay. Um, getting a little feedback. Um, okay, I'll make this lower, slower. Okay, so here's a question from Andrea Fanjoy from Toronto, Ontario. Assessment plays a big role in determining the school culture and effectiveness of pedagogy. What can we learn from High Tech High on creating a more promising model of assessment? Who would like to begin on that one? And this could, of course, doesn't have to be high tech, high specific for you, Alec, because sure. you are going to be uh, looking at the quality of your student work, right? Would you yeah. like to say something about what you're doing and already in Sprouts? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so some of the people I work with always make fun of me for being too attuned to language, but I think one of the nice places to start with a question like this is the fact that assessment is something that's usually done to students, and most of the things that we want to focus on are phrases that are things like demonstrating competence, like things that we're asking the students themselves to do or that the staff themselves do. Because oftentimes, like in the programs we run, the way we frame a program, so for example, um, a program we just finished up where people were designing building their own wind turbine and working in teams to do a bunch of different uh, kind of clean tech projects, uh, there's, there are really natural dimensions of performance for the project, like the efficiency of the turbine or the satisfaction of the family that you're working with to install that project in. Um, and even though those are connected to things that people typically describe as like curricular standards, we never want the students or staff thinking in those terms when they're thinking about is the work they're doing hard and personally meaningful or authentic to them. And then our job is to kind of translate it into those terms. Um, because ultimately, when we set up a project with students, we want them to have a sense of what success looks like that has nothing to do with the staff's opinion of it unless they perceive the staff to be like an expert on that subject that where they're soliciting their artistic input or their mathematical input, um, or that they think of the staff as like a, a client or a recipient of that project. Um, and so ultimately we want those kind of dimensions of performance to be totally outside of the, the fact that it happens to be a quote unquote educational context. Um, and that's mostly where we try to push it. And we have to do a lot of work to kind of interface with the fact that curricula exist and standardized tests exist and all that type of stuff. We've tried to pull that out uh, from the students' experience as much as possible. Very good. Thank you. And we, and we uh, when we began, uh, besides obviously all, everything you're saying about the work that students do and faculty do, uh, we felt that, that college completion was going to be an important um, ethos for us, and there are several people today who say that everybody doesn't need to go to college, uh, to which my response would be that um, even those kids who ultimately might not go to college are better served by not being segregated from those who are and from programs that prepare them and expect them so that they might be. Uh, Melissa, can you say something about what we do about, that? that is a form of assessment in a way for us, is, you know, and it gets us out of the box of, of, of standardized test scores mm -hmm. is, is having the college completion rates that we do and what you do in that regard. 
Sure. I, well, there's a couple things that came to mind when I read that question. Um, first of all, it's I definitely um, appreciate the idea that assessments determine a school culture. And towards that end, one of the questions I always appreciate comes up quite a bit in conversations with teachers as, you know, do you teach history or do you teach kids? Um, are you looking to prepare kids to be successful as a freshman in college or are we looking to create, this isn't my quote, this is from an author, uh, well-adjusted 35-year-olds, right, who are able to look around and really also understand so much more about their world than just whether or not the test that they took is going to be reflective of what they're going to have to do next year at whatever the college they're at. Um, so I, I appreciate that. One of the things I, that I think goes into building the high-tech, high culture is that we ask, we, we constantly are asking ourselves those bigger questions. Um, do you teach math or do you teach kids? And I think if the answer is I teach kids, then I think the way that you approach assessment changes. And I think that it changes towards that personalization and towards that personal rigor. But it, it, it doesn't mean that it doesn't that doesn't also include um, important questions around um, content and around learning as well. Um, I think that goes towards building a culture where kids feel valued for their learning, their thinking, and their production at their own pace and, at, and, and be feeling valued for what they see and for how they see it. Um, and I think that when you have a student body that's in particular as, as widespread as ours is, um, finding ways that you can value those student voices through assessment and through regular classroom projects that integrate perspectives um, is really the only way that you can bring together that kind of a microcosm and have it work, particularly in cohorts that are only 100 kids large or 150 at the most. Um. Thank you. And, you know, I want to go back to Alec for a second when he said that other, your, your friends are kind of tease you a little bit about your, your focus on language. Yeah. Uh, a, a, a favorite quote of mine from Confucius is, if you want to change the society, you need to change its language first. And even as Melissa points out, this, this word assessment, what do we really, <laughs> a lot of meanings of, of assessment and, and what is it that really counts. And uh, so... For this next question, um, I'm, I'm going to focus in particularly on directing it to to the the four of you uh, who work or have or attend High Tech High. Um, what this is a, an unnamed author, so I can't uh, identify it. What do you do to ensure that the racial and economic power dynamics within High Tech High don't mirror those outside of it? Mm. Well, I think one thing that's really interesting about that question is if uh, our the student body makeup is almost a reflection of the census. So, and to a certain to a certain degree, our student we're already kind of set up to mirror a societal structure. And so, I think taking that, but then looking at what we do as individual teachers in our classroom to maybe break down like what it would feel like if you're if you're coming from San Diego and maybe the city doesn't feel diverse to you because where you live, everyone you see looks a certain way, um, I think that gets kind of relates to Alex's points about um, language. So making sure your classroom is a place where you honor the experience and language of everyone and making sure your content does that same thing, which is what Melissa's talking about. So do you just teach history, do you just teach the civil rights era or do you actually use that movement to uh, reflect on the culture as, as a whole? So you could teach civil rights but then how do you use that as a reflection to say well where were the women in some of these things? And so I think um, what we do is we try to uh, enable teachers to be a little uh, free with their, their content but also make sure that we're um, pushing teachers to honor the, the experience of students and, and teachers in their school. And, and Jeff uh, last week said something about the power of projects. Um, and, I, and I think that that's really, really, really important. I moved here from New Hampshire uh, six years ago, where it's one of the whitest states in the country. And um, I got a job on, uh, at, down at the Chula Vista campus. And which has, a, I think, a 60% Hispanic population. So I had no idea what I was getting into when I walked into um, my, my classroom down there. Um, and I was really nervous. Uh, but what I found was is that kids are kids. I didn't really, I, I'm an art teacher, and I, and I, but I do see that, and I, but I collaborated with every one of the other subjects um, while I was working there. And when, with projects, you have so many entry points for different kinds of skills that a kid who's been sitting in an AP middle school class for too long may not have access to 
um, um, the, the kind of skills that, that another that another might have. You're getting, some, you're getting some feedback there. Yeah, uh, Veronica, your mic is. I had to mute. Sorry, but I had to mute you because your mic is giving feedback. Okay. Yeah. All right, uh, Melissa, I see you're you're ready. Right. Well, what I would say to that is that I, I'm not sure that what we want to do is create a school or create a classroom where we. Um, try not to have the the racial or socioeconomic realities of the world not reflected, particularly when you have students who they see it around them within their classroom settings. What I would say is working hard to create a structure within the classroom that is safe for the students to question it, to see it, to feel it, to engage in it, and then to hopefully even be part of a structure where they can see something else um, for both, for both angles, you know, whether that is a, a have or a have not that comes into that particular system. I think creating safe safe spaces with adults that believe in personalization and getting to know each student for where they're at and values them for the gifts that they have, that creates a situation where the, 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 the threat that comes along with those, I think, racial and socioeconomic issues that students bring with them hopefully allows them to question it for these eight hours a day that they're with us and then hopefully grow in their perspective. And this, this I think, relates to the, to the point that the purpose of public education is not just to serve the public, it's to create the public. Okay, Max, what do you, what, do you want to have something you'd like to contribute about the dynamics uh, within High Tech High in relationship to outside? Uh, or, oh, sure. Yeah. yeah, so from what I noticed, you know, being on the inside, is that High Tech High lacks a lot of the programs that uh, tend to accentuate, you know, economic and cultural and social differences between students. So one major thing probably is like the fact that we don't have AP classes. Um, what I would guess is that the students who take AP classes are largely students who have plenty of resources, probably wealthy, probably not a minority. Um, and so that's one way I guess that we make sure that um, the racial and economic powers in the school don't mirror those outside of the school. Mm -hmm. And then beyond that, uh, having all the students sort of mixed up and not being able to choose their classes creates a lot of healthy cultural exchange and uh, kids interacting with uh, kids of completely different backgrounds and you know on top of that we have a, a faculty that's extremely diverse so no one really feels that they're you know alienated at the school. Okay, really good. Thank you. And so our next question relates to something that, that we've all been talking about, which is the, the fact that um, we have housing segregation and, um, and that school segregation is essentially um, an outcome of housing segregation. At the same time, there's something to be said about neighborhood schools. <laughs> and here's that question, which is, what have you found to be an effective response towards stakeholders who lionize, quote, neighborhood schools. I'm thinking about specifically communities where students must overcome the impact that poverty has on learning and race and socioeconomic status are homogenous. So what about this, this challenge? Because we are not a neighborhood school. We, we intentionally located ourselves as close to downtown as possible. The reason that we did that was because this is the, as close to the little bit of public transportation there is in this city compared to <laughs> elsewhere. And also because of the feeling, whether we were correct or not, that downtown, uh, besides that it's where people go to work, it sort of belongs to everybody and therefore it sort of belongs to nobody. Um, what if anyone want to comment on, on, on our relationship here because people out there are going to, and you're, certainly Alec, you're going to be dealing with this, True. about about not being a neighborhood school. Alec, do you want to yeah. say anything about that? Yeah. Sure, sure. Um, there are a few different responses that we have when people bring this up because typically in our context people's concern is in some ways just the opposite because Somerville has enough economic diversity, people are already sensitive to that issue. Um, however, the weakest claim I feel like you can make is that regardless of whether neighborhood schools are good for everyone, it's clear that there are enough people who want something that feels diverse and feels democratic and represents some picture of a healthy civil society that you should be able to run a school like that um, without having to intrude on other people's desire to do that. A second, a little bit stronger claim is that even if a particular family wants a neighborhood school, 
um, they should be open to having a conversation about whether that desire contributes to broader kind of like social and civic responsibilities in terms of exacerbating inequality, where even if it's nice to know all of your neighbors and walk to your school, recognizing that all of your neighbors look like you and work in industries similar to you might carry with it a certain responsibility to contribute in a different way to the broader kind of community. Um, because most of the people that we hear advocating for neighborhood schools, sometimes there's, there can be kind of ugly undercurrents that are racial or ethnic without even meaning to be, where people just feel very uncomfortable with the idea that their kid's going to be hanging out with people whose values and background look so different than that. And usually when we start pushing that direction, because we have the luxury of not needing to, we're not governing an entire school district. We're just saying we want 40 kids a year who are excited about what we're offering. Um, we can usually carve out a niche in the conversation for people to accept that. Very good. Um, Melissa, I didn't know if you were want to contribute to this or not. Feel free to decline. Um, I will decline at this time. Okay, fine. <laughs> so, so now we, we have this, this question of um, um, we're getting a little bit into um, there are several questions that people are asking about standardized testing in relationship to all of this and, um, and we are going to be dealing with some of this later on but I think it's worth flirting with some of these questions because there are biases that are built into standardized testing. So since we're talking about equity, I think I think that we can carve out some room in this conversation for for how we're all struggling with it. Okay. Um, so um, th the first question is if if common intellectual mission, which is one of our design principles, also means no tracking, how does a project-based learning school deal with state standards? that are based on tracking. Moreover, how does standardized testing play a role in the program's overall design? Uh, for example, the size of our school and the size of our cohorts because we intentionally have small schools and we have small cohorts. Uh, before I see who would like to pick up on that, and that, by the way, came from Zahn in, in uh, Madera, California. You know. Oftentimes when people say to me, how come you only have, you know, a few hundred people in each of your schools because high schools typically have two or three thousand people in them, my response is, how come in every private school in the United States there's usually a few hundred kids and they're charging twenty-five or thirty thousand dollars? If it was such a good idea and they were getting multiples more than we do, why don't they have two or three thousand kids in their schools? And the reason is it doesn't work that well. And so size um, of school I think is a is a significant factor in having uh, students emerge basically so um, so as far as state standards are concerned does anybody want to well I'll, I'll just have to say that's a great a great thing that, that I love quoting people Einstein said is not everything that can be counted counts and not everything that counts can be counted what about state standards and their relationship to what we're dealing with Melissa do you see that on your come across your plate at all with the teachers in your school we I, I think that the you know I even in a project-based school like high tech high certainly we do grapple with the questions like you know the fact that our students need to post a good SAT score right and and they need to be able to to produce on certain um, tests that do continue to be valued in ways that are important to them like for college admissions or being able to to reach a certain um, um, a certain benchmark that's going to make them eligible for some certain school that they may be looking at. Um, uh, and what I would say is I think that there's a very healthy way of looking at those tests in a way that is that that uh, conceptualizes those skills with and values them for what they are and perhaps doesn't overvalue them uh, for what they aren't. I will also say that you know in in in, in a multi-skilled classroom um, it poses a, a sincere challenge for teachers that are working with with students where you know what happens when you you end up with a beautiful product but you know that only half your class really contributed to it and the other half was still struggling with really working within those systems that are part of a project based environment and i think those very real questions um, uh, they, they're all they all factor into those standardized test questions. Um, I will say that you know what we know looking at at the outcomes and what our students have done, um, their success at college in, in the university is without question, um, and and their ability to understand the need for something like an SAT test or preparing for those sorts of tests and valuing them for what they are um, is also reflective in how our students have succeeded. So. Okay, and thank you. And Alec, do you want to say anything? Because you mentioned a little bit before about MCAS and some yeah. of the things that 
you're going to have to cope with. Sure, sure. I mean, so we've we've naively, unlike a lot of other people on this call, we've never actually run a school, but uh, naively we're trying to approach this uh, pretty adversarially in the sense that neither student nor staff necessarily intrinsically care about standards. They care about doing good work. They care about getting the jobs they want, starting the families they want, getting into colleges they want. And so in a lot of ways, we feel like uh, we know what good and deep work looks like, and part of the administration's job is to kind of run defense for those good learning experiences, because unfortunately, from the state's point of view, a school basically reduces to like a black box that turns you know, tax dollars and students into test scores and documentation if you've covered some sort of curriculum. And nobody involved is really interested in that. And so, for example, for us, that's concretely translated into an approach where um, we want the students and staff to be designing and coming up with projects that they work on, and then we explicitly set aside staff and students' time to retrospectively map those projects back onto curricular standards, just to try to, try to kind of broaden the room so that when uh, staff members walking into the room, they're not thinking, okay, today these 25 students need to cover this set of standards, like this particular unit, but instead they're thinking, okay, this next month or two, this person should really deal with this handful of issues that they haven't confronted in past projects. And so anything we can do to, to kind of loosen or make that more expansive, we, we try to do, um, with the understanding that um, if our students do end up going on to succeed in college and the workforce and their families are happy with the outcomes, that that'll, uh, I think, earn us plenty of cover so that even if we do end up being kind of B or C MCAS students, that's not, uh, or a B, a B or C MCAS school, that won't be such a big deal. Uh, and then there are a bunch of other separate concerns about things like test taking skills or prepping for the SAT or interview skills that we're, we're addressing separately and we're trying to pretend don't have anything to do with the staff and student responsibility to, to create good work. You know, I, I would add also that um, as somebody who, uh, I don't mind saying this to a large audience, that somebody who basically did no work in high school whatsoever, <laughs> uh, and, and, um, and, um, and and if somebody had told me when I was 16 I would be spending my adult life in high schools, I would have ended it right there, and yet I have, is that, is that when in a non-project-based school, you can actually start at midnight and pass the test the next morning. <laughs> in a project-based school, that doesn't work. You know, you, you really, you really, it, it just doesn't work. It's really kind of the one of the, it's another benefit for those of you who are wondering about the, about the uh, it's harder, it's a harder uh, system to scam, I have found. Uh, so, so, so it is a benefit. And also, of course, the other challenge, which, which we've not really talked about, um, about a project-based school in terms of diversity, is when kids feel that there are other kids that are not pulling their own weight. This also happens, by the way, when you have teachers who are working in teams, as opposed to the typical school in which teachers are working in autonomous isolation. When teachers are working in teams, all of a sudden teachers are far more sensitive to other teachers who are not pulling their weight. I think it's healthier to have a structure in which that is revealed so that you can, so that you can improve it. Okay, so K uh, is, a, is a questioner who always comes up with a really good one every week, and she has once again. With regard to your school's demographics, can you speak to the pros and cons of having a specific target audience, e.g., at-risk students versus an all-population audience? What about specialized schools? So, so I'm, as you're each thinking about it, we had Plessy, in which the Supreme Court said separate but equal. There were a lot of people in the NAACP which existed at that time, who thought that separate but equal would be better than integrated. There are a lot of people today who think that would be better. Debbie Meyer took a different position, if I may quote her, who ran Central Park East in East Harlem, when she said, I fear that if we come to a place as a society where we feel that we can teach our own better than others can teach them, um, if it doesn't work, we have a problem, and if it does work, we might have a bigger problem. <laughs> which is a very interesting way of putting it. So what about, the, or, or single sex schools, for example, single gender schools, what about that question? Uh, anybody want to speak to it in any, in any shape? Uh, I, I feel pretty fortunate to, to have left a, a school where um, there were a lot of people that, that looked like me, and being someone who wasn't uh, super smart at the, at the beginning stages, it felt good to um, be integrated with people because I learned so much. And I think um, as an adult, I can see how those cultural um, 
experiences played out. I mean, like even even small things when it came to food, like not not understanding that kale was healthy for you because like all I you, you know collard greens. And so when I met so when I met students that 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 uh, came from families that ate organic food, I had an opportunity to take that and learn from it because in my neighborhood I didn't have a store that sold organic food and I could only imagine like what what I would have missed out on if I wasn't in a place where there was that sort of uh, integration even when it came to in, when it came to knowledge uh, a lot of the, the school when I before I came to high tech high um, a lot of people in my community were, were religious and so when I came to high tech high and met people who weren't religious I learned an entire new um, area of content and so um, I feel pretty fortunate to have been a student in that environment and now teaching it uh, or teaching in that environment I also feel I have an opportunity to provide students with new learning opportunities that they may not have had otherwise. Okay and if no one else I'm going to go to oh yes Veronica and then Patrick. I'll try my headphone and see if that helps. Um, uh, I just wanted to say I did attend an all-women's college and it was a fabulous experience. Um, but I think, as Melissa said earlier, there is a huge benefit to um, preparing our students for the real world. And so the real world, for the most part, uh, the, the world that we hope that they enter into is uh, a diverse world and a world where they come in contact with uh, many different types of people. And so I think it has an extreme extremely high value to um, be a part of that world in high school. Thank you. And was it you, Patrick? Yeah. yeah. Um, I, well, I was just going to say, I think I talked to you about this two years ago, Larry, um, when I interviewed you and Rob and uh, Ben about the core of our school, because uh, we were doing those exercises as a staff. We are trying to derive the core. And, and you had talked about how um, when when we had given, I think there was like a fifth period in the day or something like that, um, where all the students were given choice, and they naturally segregated themselves um, back into like uh, what they were comfortable with in their own cultures that they came from within their neighborhoods, um, as opposed to trying new things. Um, and uh, and that was when I think you guys were experimenting early on with like giving kids a choice on what classes they could take, and they were they were starting to do that. And I, and I I can attest to this phenomenon of like culture kind of breeds sameness. Like it's hard to get innovation out of um, always being exposed to the same ideals and principles because I'm not from a black neighborhood at all. I'm from a very poor. Um, town uh, uh, in uh, low socio uh, so, so low socioeconomic town in New Hampshire, and uh, we were viewed by the towns around us as the poor town. And I can say I was only one of thirteen kids from my graduating class that even went to college. Um, I, and and that was just because people didn't believe that that was something that they could do. Um, it, it, so yeah. Okay. Oh yes, Melissa. I just want to chime in and say I think I think there's a there's a complicated interplay in the United States as in many countries around race, uh, ethnicity, gender, socioeconomics, sexual orientation. I, I, all of those things are a complicated interplay, and I think that um, the more that we can push our students to think past that which is provided to them kind of, you know, the the things that are provided to them immediately, right? Like the things that factor into their, those identities that are provided to them by family and those things that are immediately in their own circles, the more that each of them for their uniqueness can begin to understand and negotiate themselves as a particular entity. I am thinking in particular around students of color um, and students who uh, often, from all different areas that benefit from from the cultural relativism you get by being in a socially, socioeconomic, racially mixed grouping. Um, and, and I don't think that, one of the things I love seeing actually at our schools is how within classrooms, students are placed into these amazing classrooms where there's all these different people and, and their groups are all different. And yet, yes, often when they leave for lunch, I see them leaving within groupings that are racially homogenous and they reflect a certain neighborhood and I wonder about like how healthy it may be for them to be interplaying within both of those things factoring both of those things into their notion of themselves and how, how what a healthy interplay it can be for them so um, I just want to say too I guess 
yeah, I would just be repeating myself. I think that's all I wanted to add is that well, I think that that's an important interplay. I, I wanted to add something. You just this was like phenomenal. I, I can't not talk about this really quick before we uh, go to the next thing. But like, um, one of the biggest differences between high tech high and my high school, which I had a smaller high school than the high school I'm, I was teaching in down in Chula Vista, was there was a lot more violence in the high school that I was teaching in. One of the side effects of, of having kids in these classes where they're rotating in groups and projects all the time is they begin to humanize each other much more naturally and they don't commit violence to each other. I, I saw this like, I, you will walk into the Chula Vista camp, and I, and I can't speak for all the other campuses, but I assume they're the same, but you know, you walk in and there's not this sense of, uh, um, I'm going to get whipped in the head with a, a dodgeball at gym class today. It's more of this kind of like, hey, what are you working on? What are you working on? Like, you know, kind of a uh, vibe as opposed to like having, you know, the segregated nerds on in this class and the jocks are all in this class and, and, and all of that stuff. It doesn't happen here. And I have never felt like I was in high school while working here. And I was not a very popular kid in my high school. So, <laughs> so I'm afraid of high school. Right. <laughs> I've never been afraid to work here. So. But maybe, is it is it interesting, maybe we should do a little study on whether people that create new pro progressive high schools are people that really had bad experiences <laughs> in their high schools. We, we, might, we might be on to something here. You might know. be. You might yeah. be. So I'm going to I'm going to begin to close here. I know that several people including Leslie Collins from from Calgary who always asks some good questions wants to know and I'm I'm going to save this for another time because and and we'll have some of these same panelists I think in particular Melissa for this one but that that she wants to know that um, we alluded to the hiring process and how do we delve into that? I mean how 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 do you what do we look for in candidates and their resumes and what kind of questions do you ask and how do you involve students the, and and we can we will address that however the larger question that i'm going to leave us with because it really is a topic for another day and it's a very big one is the question of having the challenges of having the 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 demography of the staff represent the demography of the student body and how important that that is and the challenge, given the history of structural racism of certain populations not having uh, comparable opportunities to go to college and become teachers and all those things, and so so it's it's a difficult it's a difficult and complex conversation. And I think that in closing, um, I just didn't want to close a conversation about the diversity of student body without leaving open uh, this other complicated question. Uh, which is the, which is the, the and, and, and a very uh, profound one about the same issue in relationship to the staff. Uh, so with that, I want to um, thank everybody who's been listening tonight. I want to thank the University of California at Berkeley, someplace I'm very very fond of, and the dean Judith Warren Little, who co-authored us this. Uh, uh, and uh, Alec, would everyone please uh, say your name again and uh, a last word for each in turn? Okay, Alec, then Anthony. Then mm -hmm. Max, then Melissa, then Patrick, then Veronica. All right. Well, it's a pleasure. My name's Alec. Uh, you guys should feel free to contact me. I don't know if my contact information is up somewhere on the MOOC or not. But, I think um, they can find it. Okay. Um, yeah, because we're just making up a lot of the stuff as we go along, and these are, are really important issues that I don't think people pay enough attention to before giving up on them when they're designing a school. That's good. Thank you. Okay, Anthony. Uh, Anthony Conright. Um, I think one thing that's just really important, uh, w which in whatever school you're uh, going to be at, is just to uh, remember to uh, try to give students as much voice to express their experience and then to create a safe environment so those experiences can be honored. And so regardless of whatever culture you're coming from, you can be seen as a person with an, with an experience and a unique perspective that then can be used to um, humanize you a little bit. And so uh, I think that is really a safe environment to really create uh, learning environments more than anything. Anthony, I need to share for everybody, it is one of the purest uh, joys in the world as an educator when one of your students becomes a teacher in your school, <laughs> especially you. OK, Max. Um, so this was a really amazing experience being a student. Um, 
on this panel and seeing basically all the effort that goes into making my school a really unique and diverse place, and I'm glad to have been a part of this uh, discussion. Okay, thanks, Max. We will have you back again because you made a great contribution. Melissa? Um, Melissa Agadello, um, I'm always just happy to be part of these conversations that are looking at opening up education, dissecting it, and thinking about it in a way that's hopefully new and innovative. Because, you know, I think about my, one of my favorite quotes is, if you do what you've always done, you're going to get what you always got. And so I'm happy to be part of any conversation that's about doing this differently so that we, we don't continue to get what we always got. Great. Terrific. Okay, Veronica? Okay, Veronica Alvarez Grajeda, just wanted to um, thank you for allowing me to participate and also offer if any people have additional questions, specific questions about how um, we conduct the lottery and the admissions process to feel free and send me questions. By the way, by the way, for people who are watching Veronica, uh, if we go back to Veronica, Patrick, if you can do that. I know what you're going to want to look at. Yeah, yeah. There, that that is a that is an art project. Uh, art. We do a lot of integration of art and oh, math, and that's about that's about the beauty of phi and the triangle. And basically, and the kids uh, picked uh, Marty Feldman, the actor, because he he didn't he didn't do too well. Uh, <laughs> and uh, leave it to teenagers to uh, come up with that one. Okay. So Patrick, you you the techno wizard of this MOOC. Uh, have any words for for the participants about? Well, uh, uh, I'm, glad I got, I'm glad I got to speak this week. Um, <laughs> this is okay, we'll, we'll, week. We'll, we'll let you out of your cage again. In the first, <laughs> this is probably the first. Well, and, and, and we got all the tech stuff rolled out. I think we we've, we've hit a good stride on these. So um, next, looking forward to next week. Um, uh, your Work your assignment for week three is due on Friday at 2 p.m. and your stuff, uh, the peer reviews or comments on other peers' work is due on Saturday. Um, next week we're going to have a look at uh, hiring and uh, faculty professional development and how we kind of like work specifically with our staff to get through some of the stuff that we discussed this week. So that was why Leslie, we referred to your question. Um, it's definitely something that we're going to be covering next week. Uh, if anybody has any questions or problems or concerns or needs to call me because they need to get a walkthrough on what they're doing, um, feel free to do so. I've been I've been trying to be as helpful and present as I can. Um, so, and, and this is a very malleable course. We're we're, we're learning as we go along. So, uh, feel free to get as much feedback as possible. Great. And, and in closing, in terms of learning as we go along, we're the oldsters who created this course, and we realized this afternoon that the next MOOC uh, that we're going to that we're going to know that gets created around here is going to be created by students, uh, and we're going to and we're going to and we'll take their course. All right? <laughs> we'll to everybody else. So thanks everyone for attending, and thanks for all the panelists. Good night. Thank you. Good night.